All right, in our second video for chapter four, we're continuing our discussion of configurational isomers. Right? We've talked about cis-trans and EZ. Now we are talking about configurational isomers where there is an asymmetric center present. And when that is the case, right, we have what's known as a chiral center, and we may have a chiral molecule. And what that means when something is chiral is that it has a non-superimposable mirror image. Okay? So they're perfect mirror images like your hands, that's the easiest example, right? But then you can't put them on top of one another, right? They don't perfectly match up versus the examples on the bottom, right? Mirror image, they would perfectly line up. You could stack forks right on top of one another for an example, but it doesn't work with your hands or your ears, right? You can't put the headphone for your right ear into your left ear. It doesn't line up, okay? So non-superimposable mirror image. Okay? Just like these objects, molecules can be chiral when they have an asymmetric center. Okay? And an asymmetric center is the most common cause of chirality, but it's not the only one. We might see other examples later on, depending on pace. But a chiral molecule has at least one asymmetric center. And an asymmetric center is where we have a carbon atom that's attached to four different groups. So 2-bromobutane, for example, has one asymmetric center. This carbon right here, it's attached to a hydrogen, a methyl group, an ethyl group, and a bromine. Four different groups. We're looking at the group overall. Even though it's attached to two carbons, one of them is an ethyl group, the other one is in a methyl group. Okay, so that is a chiral center, an asymmetric center, and 2-bromobutane is a chiral molecule overall. Yep, here's some other examples. Right, let's take this one down at the bottom. You can use the other two for practice. This carbon has a hydrogen, a methyl group, an ethyl group, and an isobutyl group. Four different groups. It's a chiral center. It's an asymmetric center. It's a chiral molecule. And you can use 4-octanol. It's another one for practice. You should be able to quickly identify these chiral centers. And when we have an asymmetric center, right, specifically looking at just one asymmetric center, we have a pair of what are known as enantiomers. Okay? Here we see the two enantiomers of our 2-bromobutane. Okay? Because if we put the mirror in the middle here, they are mirror images of one another, but they are non-superimposable mirror images. Right? They can't be put on top of one another. And you can try building them with your model kit. Right? Here's a better picture, right? So build that with your model kit. You see you can't put those on top of one another and align all four atoms. Right? And that's significant, right? Configurational isomers here, because they are, in fact, different compounds. They have same, the same physical and chemical properties, right? but they can be separated by something that's known as chiral chromatography. We'll talk about that at the end of the chapter. Right? But if you have an asymmetric center, right, that means you have a pair of enantiomers. Right? They are a subset of stereoisomers. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Right? But if you have one asymmetric center, you have a chiral molecule, which will make a pair of enantiomers. Okay. Those are configurational isomers, and they can be separated. Okay. We've already talked about everything here. Non-superimposable mirror image means you have chiral molecules, a pair of enantiomers, all those terms coming together. Okay. If you have a chiral molecule, that's a property of the entire molecule. Right. We'll see how it affects plane polarized light later on. But that treats the whole molecule. It has a non-superimposable mirror image. If something is achiral, right, looking over here at one bromopropane, right, two hydrogens, it's got the same group, so that's not an asymmetric center. And if you build the mirror image out, you can flip that around and line it right up on top of the other one. Right? It has a superimposable mirror image. So it's the same molecule. Okay. And now we need to talk about 
right, stereoisomers and stereocenters, because that's a possible area of confusion. Right? If we have a carbon atom that's attached to four different groups, that's called an asymmetric center. Right? And all asymmetric centers are stereocenters. Okay? But the definition of a stereocenter is an atom where if you switch two groups, it produces a stereoisomer. Okay, so we also see stereocenters on things that are cis-trans or EZ. Right, so all of those carbons are stereocenters. These carbons are stereocenters. That asymmetric center is also always a stereocenter, but not all stereocenters are asymmetric centers. So just make sure you're good with those two terms. Okay. So to separate them out, we need to know how to draw them and then how to name them. Right? And as you've seen from chapter three and chapter four, most of organic comes down to drawing and knowing how to do these things. Right? And there's two ways that we can represent a pair of enantiomers when we have an asymmetric center. We can use a perspective formula or we can use a Fisher projection. And you should know how to do both of these. And another thing I'll warn you, right? Don't confuse a Fisher projection with a Newman projection from chapter three. Okay? This is a Fisher projection. The Newman projection looks kind of like a peace sign. So here's a perspective formula. What does this perspective formula show us? Okay, we've got a carbon with four bonds. If it's just a normal line, that means it's in the plane of the board or the screen or the paper or whatever you've got it on. This dashed wedge means it's going back into the screen and the filled in wedge means it's coming out towards you at those relative angles because remember these carbons are sp3 hybridized okay, and they're adopting a tetrahedral configuration. But a Fisher projection was the original way to show an asymmetric center before these things could be printed out, right, just with straight lines. So let's put those on hold for now, and right? we'll cover the rules for Fisher projections in just a minute. Okay? But it's also showing an asymmetric center, right, four different groups. You have to remember the fact that that's sp3 hybridized and tetrahedral. Okay? But perspective formulas, what rules do we have for those? Okay? The two bonds that are in the plane, so just the normal line, have to be adjacent to one another, okay? That's the, really the only key thing that you have to pay attention to, okay? Then you fill in the solid wedge, that's the one that's coming out, and then you fill in the hashed wedge or the dashed wedge, that's the one that's going back, okay? and that should be next to and above the solid wedge. Okay, which if you followed all the other rules, it's going to be just make sure you put it above. So the wedges are next to one another with the dashed going above and the normal lines are next to one another. Okay, so you draw one of them, right? Take this one, for example, right? Two lines next to one another, dashed above the filled in wedge. And then you consider this to be a mirror and then you just draw the mirror image of everything. Okay, that's how you get the other enantiomer. And you can put those groups in any order at first. Right. But the second, it has to be the mirror image. For Fisher projections, if we have a carbon chain, right, that carbon chain is going down vertically. You have carbon one is at the top, and then your numbering is going down from there. And then the line that's horizontal represents bonds that project out of the plane of the screen or the paper or the board. And then the vertical lines are both going up, or sorry, they're going back. They also are going up. The enantiomer, right, instead of drawing the mirror image, has two of the groups exchanged. So let's jump back again, right, looking at these Fisher projections. Effectively, what this is doing, right, if we're following our rules here, I'm going between slide 35 and 36, our horizontal lines are projecting out, our vertical lines are going back. So if we were to look at a Fisher projection, right, what I try and remind people to do, or not remind, hint, right, take your horizontal lines and just kind of draw a bow tie and then fill it in. Sorry, this is really sloppy doing it with Zoom. So you draw a bow tie there. Those are both coming out towards you at their angle, 
right? So we've just got a tetrahedron filled into its side. And then the ones that are vertical are the dashed wedges. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. And then to switch to the other one, uh, I flip two of the groups. Okay, so you can still think about it as a mirror image with the mirror here in the middle, that works as well. Or you pick any two groups and just switch where they're bonded. Here I'm switching the hydrogen and the bromine. Yeah, good practice to continue to do it as a mirror image, just like the mirror image we had up here. Okay, so if you just think to yourself a rule to get the enantiomer, flip the ones that are in the horizontal position, then you're in business. Okay, but we also need a naming system for these things so we can determine which enantiomer we're talking about. Okay. So how do I name them? Okay. This is known as the RS system, which is based on the con angle prelog system. Two, th two names kind of mean the same thing. Okay. Whereas we had E and Z before, now we consider perspective formulas and name them as R or S when we have an asymmetric center. Okay. And we follow the same priority rules that we had in the first video to assign a priority to everything that's bonded to the asymmetric center. Okay, so assign a priority to all four things, and then you draw an arrow from one to two to three. Okay. And you need to consider where your lowest priority thing is, priority four. If priority four was on the hatched wedge, then clockwise is R and counterclockwise is S. If it's anywhere else, then you need to switch your notation, right? So if priority four is on the filled in wedge or it's on one of the normal lines, then they're opposite. Okay. So let's look at an example, right? Here I've got two enantiomers with their assigned priorities. Bromine's priority one, right? ethyl is priority two, methyl is priority three. In this situation, right, I draw an arrow going from one to two to three. And that already has priority four on the dashed wedge there. So going clockwise, this is my R isomer. So it should make sense that the other thing is S, is it? Yeah, I go from one to two to three, is priority four on the dashed wedge? Yes, okay, so that's going counterclockwise, it must be S. And we're using the same priority rules as we used in video one for assigning things as E or Z. And that's shown right here, exactly what's going on. Now, what if it's not, okay? So I look right here at the molecule on the left. I assign my priorities. Alcohol is getting priority one, followed by ethyl and methyl. Okay. So I draw my arrow from one to two to three. Right, going from one to two to three. Okay. So that is going clockwise. So it would originally be R, right? But the hydrogen isn't where I need it to be. Priority four is not in the dashed position. So because that's not the case, even though this is going clockwise, if hydrogen is not, or priority four is not where you want it to be, this is S, right? Because hydrogen wasn't in the dashed wedge when one to two to three is clockwise. Right? The textbook explains it slightly differently, right? You make a new molecule, the new molecule is R, but then you had broken two groups to make that, so then the original one had to be S, I think my way is a little bit easier, right? Just go from one to two to three. If priority four is in the dashed wedge, then clockwise is R, counterclockwise is S. If it's anywhere else, then clockwise is S, counterclockwise is R, okay? So make sure you do a couple of those for practice. That can be a little confusing until you do it. Okay. Get rid of my annotation, All right? What about Fisher projections? Right. We're still looking at our priorities going from one to two to three. Whereas in a perspective formula, we needed our priority four to be in the dash position. Right? Here we need priority four to be on a vertical bond. In that case, then clockwise is R 
and counterclockwise is S. But if it's not, right, if priority four is on one of your horizontal bonds, right, then they flip. Yep. So those are a little bit easier. And that's really the beauty of Fisher projections. They make it very easy to assign things as R or S. And that's the big takeaway from this video. We're gonna end it here, but know how to assign priorities, know how to identify an asymmetric center in the presence of enantiomers, and then know how to assign the priorities and name them as R or S. Just like in the first video when I told you that, that you need to name things as E or Z, here, 2-butanol is not a complete name. You would have to name a structure as R2-butanol or S2-butanol. And this is gonna seem daunting at first. When we first introduce enantiomers, that's one of the most difficult concepts in organic, okay? Because you have to be able to identify these things in 3D. And that's why your model kit is gonna be a huge help. I, I strongly recommend you use one of those, identify your groups, see what's going on. Okay? Practice R and S, practice this nomenclature, practice assigning priorities, because we'll continue to use it throughout the course. Practice is the key, right? Don't freak out and panic. Just practice, practice, practice.